Bronner's Foundations of Christian Faith. It was the first day of class, and I was sitting in the large seminar room before the class began with a mixture of anticipation and nerves. I was the only lay student in the room, surrounded by a string of young Jesuit scholastics. Among them are Paul Sukup in the communication department and Bill Leahy, now president of Boston College. I knew them when they were really little. <laughs> As I sat there, I began to wonder, what would this man, some of whose articles I had already read, look like? Would he be intimidating? Would I pass the course? <laughs> In Father Buckley, before meeting him, I was expecting a man of imposing and even stern demeanor, like some dark German scholar straight from the theological black forest. <laughs> but my concerns were soon lifted. The ruddy man who strode into the room in a plaid sports shirt was laughing heartily, having just shared a joke outside the door. I realized then that I was in for a very different experience than the one I had almost feared. In the course of that quarter, I learned a lot, especially about the doctrine of grace, about which I had in fact known very little. Father Buckley was very patient with me as I discoursed on what I took to be the relationship between sin and grace, neither agreeing nor disagreeing, but taking in what I said with long nods and respectful silences. <laughs> So one day I went into Father Buckley's office to have a chat about the course. And we got to talking about grace. And it was at that moment that I figured out why he had been so long-suffering and sometimes silent. It was not because I was the only non-Jesuit in the classroom. It was because he had been thinking all along that because of everything that I had been saying in class, I had to be a Lutheran. <laughs> and so began a wonderful friendship. I love being thought of as a Lutheran. <laughs> Father Michael Buckley of the Society of Jesus is our new Augustine Cardinal Bea S.J. Professor of Theology here at Santa Clara, a position once occupied by his former student, colleague, and dear friend, William Spohn. And in fact, in tonight's lecture, tonight's lecture is dedicated to Bill. And present with us is Marty Stortz, uh, his wife of several years, and also Bill's sister, uh, Catherine Wolf. And we warmly welcome you. Augustine Bea was one of the great Jesuit theologians of the Second Vatican Council and the principal author of the Council's groundbreaking document, Nostra Aetate, which repudiated anti-Semitism and opened the door to interreligious dialogue between Catholicism and the world's religions. The current holder of this chair, Father Buckley, is himself an eminent Jesuit <laughs> theologian. Prior to accepting this appointment, Father Buckley was for 14 years a member of the theological faculty at Boston College, during which time he served as the director of the Jesuit Institute and Canisius Professor of Theology. Previously, he was a member of the Pontifical Faculty of Theology at the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, a visiting scholar here at Santa Clara, visiting professor at the Gregorian University visiting fellow at Clare Hall, Cambridge University, professor of philosophical theology at the University of Notre Dame, and faculty fellow at the Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values at Notre Dame. He is a life member of Clare Hall, Cambridge University. Father Buckley is the author of numerous articles in systematic <coughs> theology, philosophy, spirituality, science and theology, and the history of ideas. Among his books are three on the origins of atheism, Motion and Motion's God, published by Princeton, at the origins of modern atheism about to be republished by Yale University Press, and Denying and Disclosing God, the Ambiguous Progress of Modern Atheism, 
also published by Yale. He is also the author of Papal Primacy and the Episcopate Towards a Relational Understanding, and relevant to tonight's lecture, The Catholic University as Promise and Project, published by Georgetown. Father Buckley has served as the president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, which honored him with the John Courtney Murray Award for Excellence in the year 2000 here in San Jose. He was a member of the advisory committee of the Princeton Center of Theological Inquiry, the chair for the Jesuit International Theological Commission, the executive director of the Committees on Doctrine and Pastoral Research and Practices for the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. He has served as a trustee for a number of universities, as well as for the journal Theological Studies. He presently serves on the Theological Consultants Board for the publishers Herder Crossroad and on the Overseers Committee to visit the Divinity School of Harvard University. Father Buckley has local connections, having spent part of his boyhood down the street in San Jose. That there's a, I have a little joke about that because the house, one of the houses where he used to live was raised and there is now a chapel erected on that site. <laughs> I said, Mike, this is a little premature. <laughs> he received his BA and MA from Gonzaga in philosophy, his master's in sacred theology from Santa Clara's Alma College, later known as JSTB, had to cut that in, and his PhD from the University of Chicago in the analysis of ideas. We are happy to have him back here with us in his native California and look forward to the contribution he will be making tonight to our ongoing thinking about education here at Santa Clara, especially at this important juncture when we are looking at a new core curriculum proposal. At such a time, it is perhaps important to remember that towering figures like Ignatius and Newman are hardly out of date. We are grateful to them for the work of its distinguished Jesuit interpreter like Father Buckley to help us learn why this is the case. Mike. Thank you. Now I suggest that you all go home. <laughs> There's no way in the world in which I could live up to that. Thank you, Paul. I'm reminded of these occasions. I was reading the life of Isaac Newton. Newton was not um, Mr. Leno. He was in a, a rollicking sense of humor. And he would lecture at Cambridge in the 1680s, as I recall. Then he was lecturing uh, in Latin, of course, for uh, one quarter, for one the term, the half, an hour a week. And he was lecturing from his book, which came out later as the Principia. Well, reading um, geometric discussions in Latin to students <laughs> did prove to be enormously attractive. <laughs> and the, um, the, uh, the most he ever had, as far as an audience went, were seven students. <laughs> and the author that I, sometimes he had none at all. And sometimes the author I, was re I read was, was reading said that when no student showed up, he shortened his lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no immediate need to do that now, I hope. <laughs> we have come together this evening to think about higher education and to do so within a community and within a history in which two dreams crossed. Neither of these was present to the other at its beginnings in the mid-19th century and each has traced over its 150 years a career that is remarkable. I speak first of the founding in the United States of Catholic secondary schools and colleges out of the hopes of a very few men and women. I speak also of the dream of John Henry Newman that the church would establish in Dublin a Catholic university in many ways modeled in its government upon Louvain and of service to all the English-speaking Catholics. What emerged eventually from the dream of the American founders was often a secondary school become a college, a college become a university. Santa Clara has written a history like this. What emerged from Newman almost by counterpoint 
was an inconstant structure, continually threatened and transmogrified, eventually altered beyond recognition, but also, also a series of what he called discourses, a book, a masterpiece, the idea of a university. The book was of such intense moment, such immense moment, that the great Cambridge professor of literature, Sir Arthur Quillacooch, could commend it to his students that the book is so wise, so eminently wise, as to deserve being bound by a young man of literature for a frontlet on his brow and a talisman in his writing wrist. And even more for our purposes, John Cameron claimed that modern thinking on university education is a series of footnotes to Newman's lectures and essays. Our hope this November evening is to enter modestly, but in very different ways, into both dreams, becoming part of that series of footnotes in what Hans Georg Gadamer called a fusion of horizons. Such a fusion will occur when the accomplishments and deficiencies of the American University draw our attention to the unattended virtualities in Newman's work. And conversely, when we allow the idea of a university to pose questions and even serious challenges to our American institutions of higher learning, provoking that critical assessment of possibilities, which is the irritating condition for growth. In such a fusion of horizons, one learns more about the text and one learns more about oneself, perhaps a bit painfully, because Newman seriously calls into court some of the usages of American higher education that have become almost axiomatic among us. This intersection of dreams focuses the question I should like to entertain with you this evening. It is, what issues, what resources, does the idea of a university present for contemporary higher education in the United States, perhaps especially for Catholic higher education? Let us begin our assessment of the idea of a university then, in the same way that Newman began his book, with the preface. For within the very first paragraph of this preface, we find the university defined by two coordinates, its characteristic activity and its appropriate subjects. The activity characteristic of the university for Newman is teaching, not research, not scholarship, not writing, teaching. The university, as Newman understood it in the 19th century, was primarily a place of teaching. And he distinguishes the university from other institutions also dedicated to teaching by the subject appropriate to its teaching. For the university, it was universal knowledge. Thus, the book opens with this very first sentence. The view taken of a university in these discourses is the following that it is a place of teaching universal knowledge. This implies that its object, that is its purpose, is on the one hand intellectual and not moral, and on the other hand that it is the diffusion and extension of knowledge rather than its advancement. So Newman initiates his discourse by distinguishing the teaching of students from the scientific contribution to knowledge that goes today by the name of research and discovery. And he insists repeatedly that the university exists above all for teaching, not for research. How many American universities today would subscribe to that thesis? I think very few. Please notice, as so many have not, that Newman is speaking about the university, not about its component residential colleges. We shall have occasion to consider the latter and the unique contribution they make at a later date. But let us first weigh Newman's insistence on teaching. 
What counted evidentially and apodictically in this conviction were the presence, the importance, and the needs of students. I quote, if its objects, the university's object, were scientific philosophical discovery, I do not see why a university need have students. In contrast to the university, Newman marked off what he called the academy as a research institution. The central activity for the academy was scientific inquiry or research, and its purpose was the creation and advancement of new knowledge. Such an academy was the Royal Society, or the Ashmolean or Architectural Society, which, as he wrote, primarily contemplates science itself and not students. Now we must make a distinction between the university and the academy in terms of teaching and research, but this distinction will be seriously miscast as it seems frequently done today in rendering Newman's theory by simply isolating teaching from research. That was not true of Newman. Newman recalls that the Royal Society originated in Oxford University, as did the Ashmolean and Architectural Societies. He reminds his readers that the academies have frequently been connected with universities as committees, or as it were, congregations subordinate to them. In his establishment at the Catholic University in Dublin, as Eon Carr makes notes, Newman did not want his faculty overburdened with lectures so that they would have time for writing and research. And finally, he established a university journal that would twice a year present the research of the faculty in arts and sciences. It is crucial to under underline that the primacy of teaching did not entail the elimination or the denigration of research and scholarship. On the contrary, good teaching, education, necessitated research and original inquiry. But it did require in the university as such, in the time and, concentra and concentration given to these varying academic commitments, their subordination to the education of the students. That was primary. To be secondary and subordinate is not to be inessential. As in their purposes, so also in the habits of mind or skills that the academy and university fostered or required. The contrast is sharp. <clears throat> I quote from Newman, To discover and to teach are distinct functions. They are distinct gifts. They are not commonly found united in the same person. He too who spends his day in dispensing existing knowledge to all comers is unlikely to have either leisure or energy to acquire new. And finally, the university and the academy differed also and profoundly in the human life that was consequent of their, upon their purposes. The life of research is solitary, human thought, and the common sense of mankind has associated the search after truth with seclusion and quiet. But the life of teaching in higher education is essentially communal. The university is itself and continues to be a common good. Teaching then defines the purpose of the university, and this gives centrality and primacy to the two major components of the university, the teachers and the students. Above everything else, above library and books, above degree programs, buildings and systems, above administrators and religious ministers, teachers are what the university is above all offers uniquely to its students. Teachers are what it offers. This may seem to you somewhat overdrawn, but in his rise and progress of the universities, Newman even contrasts two kinds of education. <coughs> Excuse me. The education through books and, and I'm quoting, the ancient method of oral instruction, of present communication between man and man, of teachers instead of learning, 
of the personal influence of a master and the humble initiation of a disciple, and in consequence of great centers of pilgrimage and throngs, he's talking about the university, which such a method of education necessarily involves. There were for Newman many ways of getting an education, and books do not a university make. Teachers and students, however, do make a university. One does not need a university for books. They can be found at home or in libraries. But one does need a university to have what he called a congress of teachers. Books are obviously critical and essential, and Newman's Apologia Pro Vita Sua records the great influence they exercised over the direction of his life. But in the university, books become an instrument of teaching, he said, in the hands of a teacher. The texts mediate the living presence and the influence of the teacher. What the university uniquely gives, as a library cannot, is the personal interchange and influence of great teachers. Let us pause to examine this prodigious claim perhaps shocking in its very enunciation. Newman contended, and I'm quoting, that the general principles of any study you may learn by books at home, but the detail, the color, the tone, the air, the life which makes it live in us, <clears throat> you must catch all of this from those in whom it lives already. Those are very important words for him. Only personal contact, conversation, argument and instruction can endlessly explore the special spirit and delicate peculiarities of his subject, he said. This is obviously, again, not to question that the written works of genius offer an endless possibility of education and wisdom, but it is to note that Newman rated personal contact and influence as supreme even prior to books. Such teachers were definitional of the life of a university, the unique offer of a university. As he said, the fullness of human wisdom is in one place alone. It is in such assemblages and congregations of intellect, that is, in the universities, that books themselves, the masterpiece of human genius, are written or at least originated. Now let me contrast this understanding of a university with another formulation of higher education, one radical and deep, liberal and liberating, one to which I myself am very much indebted and before which I pause in the greatest admiration. There was a proposal discussed and argued, adopted and perhaps even executed for a time at the University of Chicago under the great Robert Maynard Hutchins. He suggested that if a prospective student could present herself at matriculation, if she could then sit successfully for a series of 14 general examinations that cover the subject matter of undergraduate curriculum, she should be awarded the BA and proceed on to more specialized studies without taking its classes or participating in its life. There was, as you might suspect, some disagreement. <laughs> I think that Newman's theory possesses, which I never saw before, I think that Newman's theory poses some significant disagreement. Hutchins gave the decisive priority to the reading of books and the passing of comprehensive, lengthy examinations as, an indicative, as indicative of knowledge and of skills. But for Newman, the actual years lived within the university, with all of its galaxy of personal influences, were critically important. Granted that their product was much more subtle, atmospheric, and certainly more difficult to certify. There are simply too many intellectually formative but intangible influences in the university that cannot be measured by a few hours of examination. 
and whose agency only becomes effective and perceptible, perceptible in the complex and subsequent interchanges of life itself. Such are casual conversation and chance to remark, planned by no one. More formal presentation and lectures. The give and take of papers or of extended argument. The intellectual excitement and idealism evoked or communicated by battling convictions regnant in various sections of the campus. The wonderful leisure given over to bull sessions. The witness emerging over time to academic investment and engagement and integrity. All of these can, all of these come and only can come, thought, thought Newman, from that, and I quote, what that education which nature prescribes in all education, the personal presence of a teacher, or in theological language, the oral tradition. Newman's stress on the interpersonal in education brings us to the other component encompassed by the university, the students. As teaching was the university's essential activity, so its essential product was not science, nor art, nor the advancement of knowledge. Its essential product was the students, the development of the students. To make them something or other, as Newman wrote, is its great object. And what is this something or other that the university uniquely is to effect? It is their growth in liberal knowledge, in what he called the culture of the mind or of the intellect. These must be the defining effect of university teaching, as surely as discovery and invention of new knowledge must be the result of serious research. For if the teacher, or more properly the teachers together, are the agents of that activity proper to the university, the student is the product, or more precisely, the change, the growth, the intellectual maturation of the student is the product. It is here, in this student, that the university fails or succeeds in being what it is. It is by this that its life and its teaching must be judged. Everything is to further the great end of the university, the cultivation of the minds of its students, what he called their intellectual culture. The university is to develop, to enlarge the students in two ways. First, in her habits of acting, the manner in which she goes about things or conducts herself. And secondly, the objects that she knows. Let us look at each of these. An education such as Newman envisages, a liberal education, is to foster in the students certain habits of acting. He gives examples of these the force, the steadiness, the comprehensiveness, and the versatility of the intellect, the command over our own powers, the instinctively just estimate of things as they pass before us. This, he said, is the real cultivation of the mind. It brings the mind into form. The purpose of the university as such is neither moral nor religious excellence. It is the beauty of the intellect. <clears throat> it is this beauty of the intellect that the human mind is brought into form. Allow me to cite Newman on this subject. This is Newman. Intellect, too, I repeat, has its beauty, and it has those who aim at it, the teachers. For education is to open the mind, to correct it, to refine it, to enable it to know and to digest, to master and to rule and to use its knowledge, to give it power over its own faculties, application, flexibility, method, critical exactness, sagacity, resource, address, eloquent expression. All of this is an object as intelligible as is the cultivation of virtue, while at the same time it is absolutely distinct from it. 
Such are the habits of acting that the university is to engender. They make up the philosophical habit of mind. And if one asks who in the Western world embodies such a mental culture, I would suggest, you could just ask many, but I suggest four. George Keenan, Isaiah Berlin, Karl Rahner, and Newman himself. For the general content of such a liberal education or the objects of this knowledge, what one comes to know and to love in liberal education is unlimited. The student is not to be confined to any particular specialty, but you should have some grasp of the character and the interrelationship among the various forms of human knowledge, among which she will select her future profession and direction. <clears throat> Newman called these various knowledges the sciences. Let us look at this. There is obviously no way that the human intellect can comprehend all that is. It needs to abstract from some aspects of things and to prescind from others, and so to formulate and concentrate, concentrate upon various sciences that will themselves, as he said, embrace respectively larger or smaller portions in the field of knowledge. Thus there is an inescapable pluralism or manifold among the various knowledges. There is a diversity among them because there is a diversity of principles and components and evidence and methods that must be respected. The student must come to see that ethics, for example, is not anthropology, nor experimental psychology, nor economics, nor liberal studies. But each will tell something fragmentary about what it means to be a human being. You cannot reduce all social problems to ethics and then persuade yourself, even self-righteously, that you have solved complicated issues in economics and psychology. To acquire some understanding of the intricate thing that is a human being, or a human culture, or a human society. All of these sciences and many more must be brought into play. To exclude any one of them, or re to reduce all of them to one because that is the only science you happen to know, and I quote Newman, <coughs> prejudices the accuracy and the completeness of our knowledge altogether. In that exclusion, the individual science becomes cancerous. It substitutes its own disordered growth in the place of its missing sister. And so political economy can illegitimately subsume ethics, moving from arguments about the acquisition and distribution of wealth to the constitution of the good life. Physicists will write books on the meaning of it all. Literary criticism will declaim apodictically on social and economic structures, and Roman theologians may pronounce on the hypothetical character of the planetary system or of evolution. Each of these disciplines represents an aspect of what is. Collectively, they form the educational pattern that the Hellenistic Greeks called enkukleos paideia, what has been classically translated as the circle of the arts, or since the 19th century, as liberal or general education. This education comprises the skills and knowledge of free human beings, what they need to realize the possibilities and promises of human life. Such an education gave an abiding temper or quality to the intellect and the human sensibility and issued in what Newman called the philosophical habit of mind. <clears throat> this common purpose to produce this kind of reality demanded that the faculty, the professorial body, itself become a genuine community, one based upon the interchange and collaboration and evoking or instilling that culture of the intellect which is the philosophical habit of mind. Such an effort requires that the unique intellectual community which is the university, excuse me, such an effort requires that unique intellectual community which is the university with the faculty at its heart. Obviously no student can take up and master all these disciplines. The philosophical habit of mind is not another word for dilettantism or high pedantry. 
but students can obtain some sense of this academic plurality and of the endless riches of an educated sensibility by living in the university for a time where this plurality is represented by the faculty and the curriculum. As Newman wrote, the students will be the gainers by living among those and under those who represent the whole circle of the liberal arts. This I conceive to be the advantage of a seat of universal learning of a university. It is an assemblage of learned men, we would say men and women, of learned men, zealous for their own science and rivals of each other, and are brought together by familiar intercourse and for the sake of intellectual peace, to adjust together the claims and relations of their respective subjects of investigation. They learn to respect and to consult and to aid each other. This is the community that the faculty, as the constant dynamism of the university, and the community itself is continual teacher. One understands such a communal institution much better if one respects how it comes to be. And so Newman in his historical sketches upon the genesis of the university out of a series of preceding and succeeding but imperfect academic communities, and finally out of the constituent colleges, says this. Generally speaking, he wrote, the university has grown out of schools or colleges or seminaries or monastic bodies which had already lasted for centuries and different as it is from them it has been little else than their natural result and completion. Indeed, one of the deadly problems that beset and crippled the Catholic University of Dublin was its lack of such an organic history. It did not emerge out of previous academic communities. But the colleges of the university, as Newman envisaged them, continued in their own analogous way. The Museum of Alexandria, the great Muslim co colleges at Cordoba, Granada, and Malaga, and the cathedral schools and, co and colleges of medieval Europe. Now, <clears throat> Newman, in this insistence upon the organic growth of the university within the colleges, reminds one very much of Aristotle in contrast with Plato. You may remember, you may not, <laughs> that when in the Republic, Plato wanted to give a more adequate instantiation to justice so that they could see this virtue writ large and could discuss it better, he embodied justice in the polis, the city-state. And he built this community in the dialogue, rationally and artificially. That is, in terms of the functions that were to supply human <clears throat> needs. You want a city. Okay. You need a farmer. You need a builder. You need a weaver. You need a shoemaker, and so forth. And when all of these partners and helpers are gathered together into one habitation, and they supply all human needs, the body of inhabitants is term, termed a polis, a city-state. These constituents could address all human needs, and the conjuries of these functionaries make up the city. Okay. Now if you look at the opening of the politics of Aristotle, Aristotle in sharp contrast traced the polis as it organically and actually developed out of previous communities. The families grew into the household or clan. These households to the village or the town. The towns finally grew into the polis. And because of his care and respect for these evolving and component communities, Aristotle could never eliminate the family for the authorities or the guardians, as Plato did. The family was a constituent unit of the polis. And so Newman, dwells even lovingly upon the residential colleges of the university, these abiding constituents of a university. Devoted to study, the colleges are to said to be a home for those who live within them. And Newman's choice of home for the residential colleges
carried much of the English connotation of that beloved word. The college was to provide security and refuge and shelter and moral training, instruction for the young, and to become for them over the years, Newman wrote, the shrine of our best affections, the bosom of our fondest recollection. These residential college continued into the 19th century, the school that preceded the rise of the schools that preceded the rise of the university. But they contrasted almost by counterpoint with the university they constituted. So the colleges constituted the university, and yet it was distinct from them. They had very different purposes. Let me read you one paragraph of Newman on that. The university is for the professor, and the college is for the tutor, the resident instructor. Okay. The university is for the philosophical discourse, the eloquent sermon, the well-contested disputation, and the college for the catechetical lecture. The university is for theology, law, and medicine, for natural history, for physical science, and for the sciences generally and their promulgation. But the college is for the formation of character, intellectual and moral, for the cultivation of the mind, for the improvement of the individual, for the study of literature, for the classics, and for those rudimentary sciences which strengthen and sharpen the intellect. Much of the stuff that he said about the university is to be accomplished through the colleges. The university being the element of advance will fail in making good its ground as it goes. The college, from its conservative tendencies, will be sure to go back and recoup, because it does not go forward. It would seem as if a university seated and living in the colleges would be a perfect institution as possessing excellences of opposite kinds. So if one stays with Newman's name of university, and attempts to equate it with the contemporary American institution of that name, and fails to attend to the radical differences and to the critical character and contribution of Newman's colleges, the humane and religious formation of the students will escape him. Much of the university was worked through the life of the colleges. Since the Middle Ages, the colleges had grown to become, he said, the medium and the instrument of the university action. The university was to be seated and living in the colleges. It is imperative also not to miss the religious and pastoral office that was the province of the college tutors. The tutors within the college, living with the students, the life of the colleges. Newman had struggled to restore to Oriel the irreplaceable personal relations, the guidance and the influence that the tutors should exercise in the lives of the students. At great personal cost, he had insisted upon the irreplaceable relationship between the tutors and their students, scoring the distance between the tutors and the students as a fundamental corruption of the tutorial collegiate system. And as an old man, he could recall, I quote, when I was public tutor at my college at Oxford, I maintained even fiercely that my, my employment was distinctly pastoral. I confess that by statute of the university, a tutor's profession was of a religious nature. I would never allow that in teaching the classics, I was absolved from carrying on by means of them in the minds of the pupils an ethical training. I considered a college tutor to have the care of souls, and to this principle, I have been faithful all my life. And what Newman remembered after so many years, his fellow students retained with great gratitude. Thomas Mosley, who had become a student at Oriel the same year that Newman became a fellow, remarked, quote, there were plenty of college tutors in those days whose relation to the undergraduates about them was simply official and nominal. But in contrast, Newman stood in the place of a father, or of an elder, or an affectionate brother. It was such a college, and through it such a university, 
to which the young instructor would be affiliated as tutors, so as, as beginning members of the faculty. To this college they would become bound as permanent members. According to the expectations, they would year after year meet a set of responsibilities. As the tutor passed through various positions at the university, he would remain a formative member of the college. He would live within the college and the society of other members of the college, whether at high table or public lectures or even song, while caring for the multiform progress of the students. The college and the university would command his loyalties all the way through his life. He might, and often did, leave the university for another career, but he seldom would leave it for another university or college. With Newman, his loyalty was to Trinity College as a student and to Oriel as a fellow. He speaks of being proud of my college, and it is about Trinity that the Apologia becomes poignant. Trinity had welcomed him as a boy, and now as a cardinal was to honor him as an old man. Saying goodbye to his former teacher at New Trinity, Newman recalled as he ended the history of his conversion in the Apologia. In him, I took leave from my first college, Trinity, which was so dear to me, and which held on its foundation so many who had been kind to me both when I was a boy and all the way through my Oxford life. Trinity had never been unkind to me. There used to be much snapdragon growing on the walls opposite my freshman rooms there, and I had for years taken it as the emblem of my own perpetual residence, even unto death, at my university. It is interesting for me that so much of this the focus upon teaching and the relationship between teachers and students, the importance of the residential college feeding into the university that was home for its members, and the academic, social, and religious life therein. That is not simply Newman's reading of Oriol and Louvain. It is also the tradition of education in the Society of Jesus. In Rome, for example, the students attend the university at that time, the Roman College, but lived for the most part in such residential colleges as the German College, the English College, the Maronite College, the French College, some 45 of them, I believe. These colleges would sponsor and sustain, as they do today, much of the academic, religious, and community life. At the university, the focus would be on teaching, and the bond between professor and his students could be prolonged. It could so much so that the same teacher might accompany his students through rhetoric, years of philosophy and theology. Suarez, for example, when he was, the students went to study at the Roman College, Suarez had, uh, Suarez had a particular group for a time. And the next year they had Suarez again for the first year of philosophy. And the second year they had him again for the third, second year of philosophy. And then for three years of philosophy and four years of theology, they got to know each other rather well. <laughs> he, was not, he was not the only professor they had, but th there was a, a bond between the central professor they had and the gradual growth of the students. The life lived in the colleges and university was to develop the students in what the Jesuit constitutions call learning and good habits of life. Now, do you think we're going to take a couple of minutes break? Or would you want to go on to the second part of this lecture? <laughs> For, forge ahead. Forge ahead? All right. Ahead. Courage, he said as he pointed to the shore. <laughs> <laughs> it might be appropriate. What's that? There's water. Thank you. I have a water you know not of. <laughs> It might be appropriate at this juncture. Okay. It might be appropriate at this juncture to raise once more our governing question. What challenges does Newman's understanding of the university, even as we have so sparsely inventoried it here, what challenges does it pose for the contemporary American university and perhaps especially for Jesuit higher education? 
primary and foundational to everything he wrote is obviously the centrality given to teaching. But the world has turned many times since such a proposition would pass muster <coughs> unchallenged. Clark Kerr, the brilliant former professor of the university, president of the University of California, traces two revolutions in the understanding of a university since the teaching university of Newman. At the very time in which Newman's discourses were appearing, the American universities were shifting their paradigm from the Oxford-inspired university living in its colleges to Berlin and the research university of Wilhelm von Humboldt, established by the Prussian ministry in 1809. Van Wyck Brooks locates the beginning of this revolution in American higher education in the Wanderer Yara of Edward Everett and especially in George Tickner at Göttingen. 1815-1816. The subsequent decades were to import this German influence into Harvard and through Harvard into American higher education. The university was increasingly to be defined and evaluated primarily by scholarship, research, and publications, and distinguished by its graduate departments and professional schools. A development and specialization fostered by such distinguished leaders in American higher education as David Coit Gilman and Johns Hopkins in 1876, and the redoubtable Charles W. Eliot at Harvard from 1869 to 1909. The major state universities and land-grant colleges followed suit. <coughs> now, with the primary emphasis increasingly given to research and specialization, as Clark Carr points out, each professor had his own interests. Each professor wanted the, state, the status of having his own special course. Freedom for the student to choose became freedom for the professor to invent. And the professor's love of specialization has become the student's hate of the fragmentation. This became the modern research university with all sorts of variations. It eventuated in what the American philosopher Sidney Hunt perceived and what he called the subtle discounting of the teaching process. In the undergraduate practices of many universities, whatever their proclaimed values, research and publication came to outweigh serious teaching. It is obviously easy, easier to total up the scholarly articles and referee journals than to assess serious, provocative, and formative education. In such a world, the undergraduate courses become larger, the mode of teaching invariant lecture, more core courses are taught by graduate students, the content of the courses is increasingly influenced by research interest of the faculty, and the personal contact between teacher and students is rationed by a unit with, uh, to a unit within the office hours of the professor. If there is a core curriculum, it can represent the various power blocks within the faculty, much more than a collaborative attempt to achieve anything remotely like Newman's comprehensive philosophic habit of mind. Students calling upon the faculty for whatever reason can even be seen as threat. They are taking valuable time to would otherwise be used to scholarship and discovery. Horror stories abound. <laughs> One very different. One very distinguished professor at a well-known university enthused to me that a major perquisite at his institution was that there was no need to talk to the students. <laughs> and another, it is by no means unknown that tenure can be denied to a member of the faculty recently honored as teacher of the year. <laughs> Some 35 years ago, Christopher Jenks and David Riesman noted the same depreciation of teaching in favor of research in American higher education. I'm quoting, while we do not think that there are many brilliant teachers who never publish, we do think that there are many potentially competent teachers who do a conspicuously bad job in the classroom because they know that bad teaching is not penalized in any formal way. They have only a limited amount of time and energy, and they know in terms of professional standing and personal advancement 
it makes more sense to throw this into research than into teaching. Newman can seem little more than quaint in such an academic world. Indeed, contemporary volumes on higher education patronize the style of the idea of a university and employ its content as a benchmark to celebrate how far we have progressed beyond this academic cloister. Clark Kerr insists that by 1930, the United States had advanced significantly beyond even this modern university of German influence into what he called the really modern university, the multiversity. One can call this development a second revolution. But in all these revolutionary advances, one cannot help but question what is happening to teaching, what is happening to the student. One can even ask if the very concept of a university, of a university, a unity out of the many, has been quietly evanescing. Can the vast departments that now divide the multiversity not settle into so many contiguous seminaries each closed off in its own specialties, languages, and research institutions. Do you not need to be small enough, as well as large enough, to be a university, to achieve that unity and collective day-by-day -day interdisciplinary conversation and influence that once entered definitionally into the notion of a university? And even further, if one is to search for this unity of interchange today, Will one not find it better served in the more distinguished colleges in the United States than in the undergraduate programs at many great universities? Perhaps Newman's distinction between the university and the academy can suggest for us a second and even more radical consideration, a somewhat different structure for the university itself. Perhaps American higher education needs a sharper differentiation of the undergraduate education from graduate education, and a distinct academic institution or faculty that would feel this undergraduate education, an institution that would possess its own educational finality and intensely collaborative structures within the more general collectivity that is the university. This could be the college within the university. Teaching and intellectual formation of its students would be its focus not to the elimination of research and writing, but to the promotion of teaching as its central activity and the intellectual culture of its students as its essential product. This product should define the college. But does not vital teaching figure importantly in graduate education also? Of course it does. But for Newman, teaching in graduate education does not focus so much upon the general mental culture culture of the student as upon an increasingly specialized knowledge of particular fields and professions and disciplines. The focus in graduate teaching should be upon the induction of the student into a specialization with all the demands methodologically, evidentially, and so forth to go with that. And the development towards mastery, research, publication, and the advancement in this field of genuinely new knowledge. The student is assimilated into the life and specialized habits of scholarship. But the primacy of teaching in the undergraduate school focuses upon the general mental culture of the student, as we have said, the humane empowerment of her mind, and the sensibility for a task and the lot that is the work of a human being. I am suggesting then, for consideration, that the first challenge of American higher education the what that it can receive from Newman is to restore to the undergraduate or collegiate education a unique primacy, wise and intellectually formative teaching, and a unique finality, the comprehensive mental culture of the students that is the product of this teaching. But can we not go further, as suggested, in the establishment of the undergraduate school as a distinct institution within the major universities? as an institution with its own faculty, its own instructional structures, instruct institutional structures, all because it possesses its own distinct educational purpose. I willingly grant that the same inst instructor could be a member of both 
the undergraduate and graduate faculties. But these academic communities have a different emphasis. If the current situation in the United States is to change, excellent teaching, formative, provocative, and wise, that proposes the mental culture of the students as its primary purpose, must constitute the promise held out to the students in an undergraduate teaching, as it would name the primary care of a faculty and the stated purpose of the school. This focus, this promise, this capacity in teaching, consequently, would figure predominantly in the affiliation or the hiring of new faculty, in hiring, in the granting of tenure, and in the awarding of academic promotion. A capacity, excuse me, a centrality given to teaching and the formation of an integral undergraduate or collegiate instruction. These would constitute the first two challenges of Newman to which we might attend. Let me suggest a third. Together with the academic development of the student, the university needs to care for that community support, that moral formation and development of character, that academic and religious life which Newman thought the province of his colleges. It is unthinkable that Catholic universities in the United States should take from Newman different ways of housing undergraduate students than are presently in vogue. The restoration of the residential colleges as an academic, and yes, even as a religious community, might constitute Newman's third challenge, building upon the significant progress that has already been made in residential life. But at present in the United States, in many of our universities, young men and women in the United States are removed from their fam familiarities of their own home and neighborhoods, from the accepted mores and expectations of their parents and neighbors, their sisters and brothers, elderly relatives and lifelong friends. <coughs> in other words, they are removed from much of, what, of, excuse me, much of what will in the future constitute the manifold of their lives as indeed it has formed them in the past. And in many universities, they are often placed with thousands of others of the same age in large buildings with <coughs> lengthy corridors or subdivision into suites. There is an inevitable and artificial void of what has been familiar, formative, and even home. And in the absence of a more varied and more mature company, the culture of their years can take over. Educators wonder at American students' heavy drinking and at their hours slumped in front of third-rate programs on TV. Residential administrators with very limited success deliver exhortations warning against promiscuity, drugs, and cheating. So much in the atmosphere of the students can become banal and superficial. It can encourage or occasion regressive habits that inhibit personal development, or inhibit an idealism commensurate with their talents, and even counter the humanistic values of their education. American students have, over the centuries, attempted to modify or escape from this kind of culture with fraternities and with sororities, but it would be difficult to be very sanguine about the results. <laughs> That's a very knowing laugh. <laughs> Further, dormitories have been transmogrified, some leaving the academic and religious life of the students to the university in favor of a therapeutic concentration in residential communities upon various forms of good health and social life. These latter settlements, settlements can excise from residential life the concomitant academic education the students are at the university to receive the religious practices that go with the Catholic culture, the social commitments, and even the significant presence of the faculty as well. They can lack any vital and necessary conduct, contact with the processes of education that are fostered by the university. For Newman, the university must of necessity live most of its life, as academics insistently included, in those residential colleges which the students and the tutors and subsequent generations affectionately called home. For the hours of instruction, if they possess any vitality, must give way to the lengthy conversations of the students and in turn must be supported by a common life of those institutions 
in which they lived their lives. Barrett had said something like this that was really quite true. He said, for great thoughts and great friendships require great wastes of time. <laughs> <laughs> Education to be effective must be a matter of the day by day and the interpersonal. <coughs> in conclusion, the remarks that I have made are necessarily fragmentary and shamefully incomplete. It could not be otherwise in the interest of saying anything at all. I attempt to have attempted to dwell on three, possibly four, of the many challenges that Newman may raise for us. But there is a way even here in which the challenges of Newman and the initiatives that seek the restitution of the centrality of teaching and the retrieval of the residential colleges come into a single focus, and it is this. All three of these initiatives attempt to restore and to strengthen the primacy of the interpersonal in higher education. Newman knew that system, that the system that informed the university was essential. There had to be the allocation of curricular responsibilities. There were the requirements for admission and successful programs. The site and the building, the library and the fields, the intercoordination of all these units over the course of the academic term, that is all important. But when the ultimate evaluation is done, the most crucial of all the constituents was personal influence and interchange of teacher with students, of teacher with colleagues, of students with students. This was not so much the Oxford of his day, but it is what he attempted to restore to Oriole. I quote, I say then that the personal influence of the teacher is able in some sort to dispense with an academic system, but the system cannot in any sort dispense with personal influence. With the influence there is life, without it there is none. If influence is deprived of its due position, it will not by means be gotten rid of, it will only break out irregularly and dangerously. An academic system without the personal influence of teacher and pupils is an arctic winter. It will create an ice-bound, petrified, cast-iron university and nothing else. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, for your comments, more than comments, for your inspiring uh, uh, thoughts about what a university can be, um, a place uh, for the primacy of the interpersonal. We have about 10 minutes for questions. If people would like to engage uh, Father Buckley in any follow-up questions to this uh, presentation, any thoughts uh, that he might have provoked in you that uh, he would be, I believe, happy to respond to. So. All right. Please. Well, I, I think Newman would like Santa Clara. A great deal of what you're talking about sounds very much like our uh, residential living and learning communities and our vision of a core curriculum that integrates and doesn't isolate. Um, but I'm a little uncomfortable about what I think I was hearing you say that the, the college should be the place of teaching and the graduate program should be the place of research because it seems to me that the, uh, the vision that we've articulated at Santa Clara and that's been quite successful is one of the teaching scholar who balances um, excellent teaching and excellent scholarship and even brings the student into that scholarly process, um, sort of helping the student become a researcher. 
in a way that helps to promote the discovery of knowledge. So I, I see a, a sort of a polarization of you know, the, the British model of the teaching tutorial institution and the German model of the research institution that um, I, I think doesn't need to be polarized. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's a delicate business because whenever you draw a distinction like that, it always sounds like you're drawing a separation. Mm -hmm. It's really a question of what the finality is. When a student comes to do undergraduate work, you may teach him all sorts of things and all sorts of subject matters, and all those are very important. But the, what, you, what, you, what you want to come out of the undergraduate curriculum is a student with the sensibilities and the, um, the ability to think that uh, he can bring to bear upon almost any subject he treats. I'm reading a book now called God the Delusion. What's his name? Uh, God. God. It's, it's awful. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not because he's, not, he's, a, he's a fine scientist. He simply doesn't know what an argument looks like. It's, a, it, and it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it, it, you, and the reviews have been pretty much along those lines. But it's a question. Do you have a, a, an, an intellect that makes a, a just appraisal of what's there? Do you have someone who's able to take that in? Can he mount an argument or can she mount an argument? Does she understand an argument that's mounted? Does she see how far inference can take in perception? It's all of those, I mean, a vast series of things that you want the student to get. And um, whereas, and the focus is on that, but that doesn't mean you eliminate research and all that kind of thing. I, I don't mean that. But it does. But in the but that's not what you're trying to do in graduate studies, and graduate studies at Santa Clara, you have a master's program that's very connected with the undergraduates, is it not? I mean, you're not. It's not as though you're talking about a doctoral program that is uh, uh, cut off from the rest of the university. So I do agree. You you've got to have you have to have both, but there will be emphases that are different. And the emphasis will give by what is the purpose of this institution, of this school, of this, even of this course. And for the undergraduates, it seems to me what you want is that education of the intellect. The, and uh, but that doesn't mean any, you never, I mean, you never have the old intellect running around trying to get educated by itself. It's, it's, a, it's a whole mass of things that are, that are involved, I think. Please. Would you have thought about the issue of distance learning and courses which will be put into television and taught to others that's apparently becoming a larger segment of modern education? Yeah, I have no uh, experience of that, and that's really quite different. It's, it could well be. I, I would think, just as I think a lecture, I think a lecture is a, a good thing. You can give a vision and material and data and all kind of stuff. But it's quite different from asking the students questions. And um, I think what it demands from the student is something different. Um, I think any kind of, of uh, um, uh, something that's done the way that you describe it, distance learning, is valuable. You know, if you want to learn something about the French Revolution, this, to have a number of people that are really experts in that available to people, I mean, it seems to me that, that's, that's terrific. And, what you have at the end of that is you, is you have idea where the, student is, the person knows what the French Revolution is and so forth and so forth. Ideally, though, if you have a, a teacher that really is quite good, he's communicating to you also a habit of thinking, how one learns to think about history. And that really is quite distinct from just getting information. My fear is that a number of the learning programs that are done in this mass way are much more the first and the second. I don't know. I have no experience with them. Please, Chris. It strikes me that your idea is going to have serious financial implications for the university. And I mean, if the restoration of the interpersonal into these residential learning colleges means that more faculty and staff are going to move in to the residence halls, mm -hmm. that's going to take up revenue generating spots from students. And I want to know, when Newman was formulating this idea, were colleges and universities endowed such that finances weren't as big of a consideration? Or was, were they facing the same problems we are today with high costs? I believe that the, both Oxford and Cambridge were financed by the Crown. I could be wrong, at least by the government. 
that that was up to the time of Margaret Thatcher. I think that was uh, uh, as far as the uh, uh, the Fahawid one carry this off financially. I really haven't figured that out. But, <laughs> but I, I think I, I don't think that's impossible. I just think it's a problem that has to be dealt with. But I think it's worth a try. And it could well be. I don't think you, uh, a university goes from nothing to some uh, everything. I think some a program like this, if you if you decide that that's what you wanted to do, could be done in small increments until you figure out. I think you're doing something like that right now with these um, residential learning committee communities. Are you not gradually learning from your experience and so forth and building? And I tend to think most changes are that way. That you have to do the thing gradually, otherwise you do more harm than good. St. Thomas quotes the book of Proverbs, warning people that the one who blows his nose too vigorously draws blood. <laughs> Sally? Bonner, have you given any thought to the relationship between the Ignatian formation that happens in retreat, which I have seen to be just fabulous. We're doing like the 19th annotation over a year. That that movement of the imagination, the intellect, with a good spiritual director or a good retreat director works, <clears throat> and it forms a habit of being. Have you given any thought of how you could do that using the classroom, the university, the, the classroom space? to try to do a similar movement that obviously is in retreat. Could you speak to that at all? Have I given much thought to it? No. Uh, I mean, I've thought a bit about it here and there, but I've really done no serious uh, investigation of it. Um, and you mean that the, your question is, would the processes that one finds in the spiritual exercises, would they serve also as valid instruments in education? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, you know, the, the obvious answer is yes. Now, how? <laughs> uh, well, but, but the, your point is well taken. The, uh, the function of the imagination, you know, it, it is so complicated. The, the function of the imagination in um, St. Ignatius is, um, I mean, you, there's really a move. Let's just take one day of the exercise, the, the second week of You'll notice that it, 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 there's a gradual deepening that goes through that day. So you have five hours of meditation, or whatever you want to call it. And the first two, it's um, the, the, the kind of things that characteristic, uh, characterize the human spirit, that is, memory, intellect, and will, and those are operative. And out of that, there's a certain product and a certain level of sensibility and feeling and so forth that comes. So in the third hour of meditation, you don't turn back to the content again. You rather turn back to consolation and desolation, that is, the movement of affectivity towards God, the movement of activity away from God. And what are those things that trigger those? And desolation is just as valuable there, oddly enough, unfortunately, it's just consolation. And then, so there's a simplification, and it, it, it really is much more complicated than <coughs> call her petition or recapitulation or it's much more like contemplation of John of the Cross. Then, in the fifth moment, you have, um, there's no inference at all. You, you're not doing inferential stuff at all. You're simply being there, and you're being there in, in a kind of a quasi-sensible way. And there are a lot of different interpretations of that, but there's a great deal of simplicity. So, what you have in a single day of the exercises is a gradual interiorization of the reality that you were in contact with in the first hour of prayer. Okay? Now, could you use that also in the education? Well, I would certainly think so, you know. It depend. I mean, I, any, anything that's, uh, that's, that's valid in that way, it seems to me, could be grist for your educational mill. How are we doing, Paul? Uh, we are. Maybe one more question, and then I think it's time to okay, uh, turn off the lights. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one there. more question. I didn't get exhausted. Oh, that's very good. Thank you very much. <laughs>